Mama says I need to be careful around you. Are you dangerous? Like the movie? Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I am so happy to be up here on stage talking to one of my favorite directors and one of the most exciting directors we have. Um, we're going to talk for about you know 30 minutes. We've got so uh, you've you've already had a long evening watching a great movie. Um, how you doing, Steve? You had a long day today, right? Yeah. I did, so I had a couple of glasses of wine. I think I don't think I should have. <laughs> but guess I promise you, I won't. I won't. I won't let you down. I promise you. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Yeah. You spend a lot of time in New York, right? You, you come here a lot. What, what's, yes. your, what's your routine when you have a little bit of free time here in the city? Ooh, um, I go to shows. Is Donna De Silva here? Donna, are you here? Well, Donna, Donna, Donna's done an, an extraordinary show at, at the Whitney, uh, the um, Andy Warhol show from A, a to B and back again. Uh, it's extraordinary, and uh, I, I did that, and, uh, and, I, and she's my friend. How bizarre is that? It's gonna, you know, be well, cool. Let's embarrass her a little bit more. Don, um, tell me a little bit about Donna's work. Oh, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> embarrassed? No, she well, she. well, I just think she's a gorgeous, uh, wonderful um, uh, human being. Also, just as just as a, as, as, a, as a brain, as a, as, a, as a, you know, again, you have these wonderful people that you know, and you. Is it no advertising in New York Times? Is that why you got no water? <laughs> We're so we're very pure. Moving yeah. on swiftly. Anyway, look, let's get to the chat about the film. Otherwise, people get very bored. <laughs> let's go. All right. Let's do it. Oh. You're, I, that's the problem of interviewing directors. I feel like you always want to direct, even the interview, right? I, I have this happen all the time to me. <laughs> I like to be correct. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but I was going to start with a question about you being 13, um, which I hear is when you first saw Linda LaPlante's TV series. That this well, was. I actually want to start with something completely different. I, I, <laughs> I, um, the funny thing is I was thinking then, I never, I never thought about this before for some reason. Why didn't I think about this? Why, why, why haven't I ever said this before? But then I realized, yes, so in the original Widows, uh, made in 1983, by, written by Linda LaPlante, um, none of the women had children. None of them had children. I remember thinking, okay, well, they have to have children, they have to have that obstacle as such. I mean, within the fact that children are not an obstacle, of course, but the fact that the, 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 the freedom, the whole idea of how do you negotiate the domestic with this situation? And I thought, okay, the, we've got it, they've got it, you know, two of them, well, you know, they ended up to be Linda, played by Michelle Rodriguez, and, and, um, and Belle, played by uh, Cynthia Rivo. Uh, you know, a one-parent uh, situation, um, and how that, I love the idea that, you know, how, how that, there was a time when I was in New York and I saw, used to see a lot of, you know, people, you know, uh, West Indian women in, in particular, um, babysitting women, other women's children, and there was always a case, so I had a friend of mine whose grandmother, whose mother sat her children while she sat, she looked after other people's children. And that whole kind of dynamic for me was it kind of interesting, as far as freedom, as far as, as, far as liberation, as, as far as uh, different types of feminism. And uh, I just I wanted to put that in the, in, into the movie, that whole idea of, 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 of childcare. So anyway, I threw it out. Let's jump in the deep end, eh? Why yeah, not? Yeah. Oh, well, that, me that moment really struck me, because that showed to me that this is a very different kind of, you know, if we want to put it in a genre, the heist, heist genre film, like Danny Ocean never had to worry about childcare, right? No. And, and I think in it, these people, they, even in the way the four characters are defined, you know, the typical way in a classic genre film, which this is not, is that one of them has a skill and another one has a skill, and they all come together like clockwork to, you know, uh, create the perfect team. But that's not the way these characters are defined. They're more than none, I don't even know what you would say each one's sort of special ability would be. Right? It, that's not the way you set out to make this project. I think the special ability is the journey that they go on and where they arrive at. I think the whole idea, I mean, what's so interesting, what was interesting to me in some ways of this story was you have three strands of narrative. I mean, actually four, but I won't bore you with the fourth one. You had the heist. As soon as you sort of start the projector, you sit down, 
you get the situation where the train has left the station. We, know, we understand this is the highest movie and that, that action-adventure situation will, 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 is, is, is gathering speed and you know, you know, there's, there's going to be an end uh, circumstances. circumstance. Then you have the, um, the political situation. So I knew I wanted to have this political situation in it. And we, you know, as we were speaking to Gillian, I had the idea of elections and the whole idea of, of these local elections within uh, you know, the, these aldermen and whatnot. So therefore, as soon as you got, you got, you got, the, you got the journey or the speed of uh, the political, because you know there's, there's going to be a, an election at a certain point. So you have the campaign, so you have the pace of that. Then you have the, the, the emotional uh, journey, the sort of, you know, um, the, the, the sort of, uh, um, you know, these, these women are, 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 have been dealt a horrible blow by losing their partners, but at the same time, they have to gather themselves uh, together in order to sort of uh, achieve this um, heist. And that emotional journey they have to go on in order to sort of, you know, deal with whatever, or put aside that grief, or deal with that grief, as well as, you know, go on that journey. And, and it, what I mean by that is that these women are in different stages of their journey in life. Alice is here, Belle is there, well, uh, Linda, uh, Veronica, and, and, and uh, you know, so we're gonna see a, a very much a propelled sort of narrative or, or journey for them. So you have these three strands of, uh, of, 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 uh, of movement, of pace, of speed, as far as, you know, uh, things have to happen. You know, again, I remember this, this friend who told me, I don't shit on command. Sometimes you have to. Um, and I think these women had to sort of deal with certain things coming at them at a tremendous pace and had to surf and navigate that. Um, so you have, you, know, you, you have a ch chicane and then you have a, a rapid and then of course you have the waterfall. Um, so yeah, there's, and there's more, one more strand which one bore you with. So they're always strands are interweaving. Um, so that, that's, that was interesting to me to move it forward. And that strand to me, the, the strand that these women each are sort of bridling, uh, trying to escape, trying to survive in, in yeah. sort of desperate circumstances. That seems to me very different from a lot of other heist movies that we see, right? That there's something very specifically feminist about this film and that each of them is in a relationship with a man and this one man's betrayal sets them all up in this very terrifying way. Yeah, um, I, you, um, uh, I, I, you know, uh, yeah, I, there wasn't, uh, I go, yes, yes is the answer to that question. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't much of a question, sorry. No. Uh, but I, as, as, the, as the script was coming jump. together, as you and Gillian Flynn, uh, you know, uh, who's done Gone Girl, yeah. Sharp Objects, were working together on this film. She's a Chicago native. Yeah. Um, what was the development of the script like? Well, you know, Gillian is, is, is an amazing writer, of course, and it was just one of those things where, you know, um, I wanted to set this, the, 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 the narrative in Chicago. Uh, I mean, my first museum show was in, solo museum show was in Chicago uh, 22 years ago. At the same time, um, uh, my, my, my girlfriend at the time, who now is my wife, was going to the Democratic convention where, when Bill Clinton was the president. So I say my first footprint in Chicago was art and politics. So I knew I wanted to set it in Chicago because, of course, my uh, going there for 22 years, you see things and you experience things for the first time. And in you know, the Midwest, it was a very different um, experience for me. So um, I was very lucky that Gillian was interested in, in, in working with me on this on, on this on this venture, and she was into it, which was great. So we we, would, we became sort of like um, private detectives in some ways. We went to the FBI headquarters. In Chicago, uh, we went to see aldermen, politicians off record, uh, you know, um, uh, clergy, sort of, you know, uh, uh, off record, um, uh, private investigators, the, the whole shebang. And I remember when we when we left the FBI headquarters, it was almost like, I mean, in fact, I think they wanted us to stay because we, we became almost like their shrinks in a way because we ask all these questions. I don't think they actually go to shrinks. So the fact that some people are asking a question, I did really sort of soul search was kind of very cathartic for them. What, what would an example of a question like that be? I just, you go deep, don't you? You ask a question, then you ask a question, you ask a question, you ask, and then all of a sudden they're somewhere and they don't know where they are, and then they're grabbing for straws. And, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, they're sort of getting, then you get, in, 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 you get in, in there. Um, you know, again, it's just to have, you know, talking to people and, you know, and, and listening is it's, it's what, you know, what, what, what we used to do. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, so what happened, we left the FBI quarters, it was like the Matrix, where you see all these numbers coming down. It's almost like, oh, we see things. We see how the city actually works. 
So then we sort of got to writing, and uh, you know, with with the template of, of this, uh, uh, you know, Linda Laplante, the, the nucleus actually of the Linda Laplante thing, and I want to take that that nucleus, that, that that fiction, and steep it into the reality of a heightened contemporary city, and that for me was always Chicago, because again, I want to deal with race, policing, um, politics, corruption, uh, religion. Uh, gender, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, so many things. And it's with Chicago being so segregated, again, you know, you get, you know, in, you know, you get sort of, you know, Haitian, you get Dominican, you get Puerto Rican, you get, you, 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 you get, um, you know, all kinds of spectrum of, of of the Spanish world. Then you get the Italians, then you get the the Irish, then you get uh, African Americans. Then, then you know, again, it's just crazy. It's it's um, in, in Lithuanian, Polish. Uh, all in this sort of uh, close proximity, to, to close proximity to each, other, each other, just rubbing shoulders. So I thought, well, that's that, that's the best place to place this story because, in some ways, I'm looking at the local, but I'm actually looking at the global. And uh, you know, taking Chicago as a, a, a you know an idea, as I said, Haydn, contemporary Western city, but actually talking about the world, hopefully. And how did it feel once you were there shooting? Like you talk about this, this matrix sense. Like did did that come through in the characters as you were writing them and and seeing them come to life there in the city? Did they feel like Chicago characters to you? And how do you how do you sort of work on getting the details right with you know, these big conversations where you're doing the soul searching stuff at the FBI? What what gets you from there to the details we see on the screen? Well, yeah, it's different levels. Yeah. So they, yeah. then you have to go to character, and you just you, you know you find things out. I mean the the, the with the Polish end and uh, you know Elizabeth Debicki's character and and the mother and you do a lot of you know research within that and again it's just it's just you got to be there you got to talk you got you got to you got to find these things out uh, you know you got to really sort of um, yeah it's it's the boring stuff which sort of gets fascinating that's all I mean again these characters actually exist in Chicago and the fact that matters no one's trying to flex their muscle or or sort of tr you know try to be sort of this whole idea of diversity it's actuality it's there you know, I wanted to make a film where the audience are reflected on the screen, so they see themselves on the screen. It's, they pay the sixteen fifty, and they see themselves on the screen. I mean, that's cinema. That's that's what we live for. I imagine that's what art is about, isn't it? I thought, or oh, it's only for some, maybe. <laughs> right. Right. I don't know. And uh, you know, you mentioned uh, I, I, that was a, a, something you were talking about, Daniel Kaluuya, in an yeah. interview you did recently. The yes. podcast that was wonderful, and you're talking about uh, liking the process of interviewing, trying to get deep. And, and one of the questions you asked Kalu, I thought was interesting, uh, you asked him how Get Out had kind of changed the way he saw himself. The series is called Appearances. It's kind of about oh, yeah. that idea of how the world sees you and then how you see yourself, how you move through the world um, with a certain image. Uh, for you, I guess the question is five years after um, 12 Years a Slave, how, how has that experience changed the way you see yourself? Because it's certainly changed the way a lot of movies have gotten made since. Not really, no. Um, no, 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 because I, th I have my own compass. I have my own set, my own compass at the very early stage. Because certain people try to set my compass at the very early stage, and I realize, no, I don't want to go there. I want to go here. Um, what is what? It made me make this move. Help me make this movie for sure. I don't really get into that. I think you know. I just go to the supermarket. I get my thing. I come home and and I think and then and I you know I, I don't I don't I just get on with it. You know, it's boring. It's really boring. Really boring, but then you got to do the work. It's, it's not nothing sexy going on there. I tell you. Did, <laughs> did, it, did it change your sense of possibility of the kind of impact that you can have as, a, as an artist? I was always, I, I, I was very lucky to to, to to sort of make hunger. For, that was the first thing. I was I wanted to make a movie about this guy called Bobby Sands, and I was very lucky that this woman called Jan Young, husband, helped me to get the money through to film for arts to make it. And ever since then, I've never looked back. So I always expected I was, I was gonna do anything I wanted to do until I went to HBO. And they said no, and that was it. So, you know, but that was a good learning lesson, you know? You, you know yeah. I, was, I was reading an older interview with you where you were saying even part of the reason you were doing this video art in some sense was that the idea of getting uh, the kind of budget and resources that you would need to make a feature was sort of not part of your picture when you were young. And that it was an aspiration, but it wasn't something that uh, I don't know. Um, that wasn't true. I don't think that's true. No, I was I was interested in what I was doing at the time. I wasn't thinking I needed more money to do anything. I was just interested in what I was doing at the time and trying to do the best I could at it. That 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 was it. I wasn't no. I wasn't wanting more money. No, 
not at all. I mean, I meant more opportunity, not necessarily the money. Uh, I, I, no, I had lots of opportunity. But I took, you know, I, I was very fortunate because I was very ambitious, and you know, I somehow I don't know what happened, but I was very fortunate to do. I just took my opportunities because even if you had, I remember when I left NYU, which I was at a terrible time at. I went back, and there was a guy called David Curtis, who was at the British Film Council. He said, "If ever anything happens, you should you should come back and and you know I, I'll try to help you out." So I came back and I said, look, and I, you know, NYU, did, it, didn't, it didn't happen for me. And he gave me 5,000 pounds and I made a, a film called Five Z Pieces. And that, you know, that was a saving grace. It's just one of those, I was very fortunate people sort of were looking at what I was doing and, and wanted to help. That, that was it. That, you know, I, I was, there, was, there was a bit of luck, but I made, my, I made my own because I had to sort of execute it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking at your early work, I'm, I'm curious about how a film like this that a lot of people are sort of, you know, a whole lot of people are going to see in the world, unlike, you know, gallery art in a museum, possibly. Um, how did the, the, you see those themes of, like, the ways bodies move through the world, the, the, your, your sort mm. of interest in sort of uh, theme and uh, subject, how do you see those re reflected in this film? Do you see threads that tie this film back to some of your earliest works? Uh... I just get on with it. I think I th the thing about the thing about you said about um, other p more people seeing the film than other, I don't know. That I, you know, if you see, you know, how many people go through go in and out of museums, take modern sort of attendance is 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 huge. So that's not necessarily true. Yeah. Well, no, I, and I, mm. I I guess I was thinking you did an interview recently where you said you were interested now in this idea of, the, of engaging a wider okay. public. And okay. I know, but I but oh. I wanted to ask that question in terms of both your film work and your artwork because obviously. You know, you recently announced you're doing a series of photographs of school kids. We're going to have 100 and, uh, something like over 100,000 school kids photos um, and, and as part of this exhibit. And that is, that is a very, you, you've, you're, the ambition and scope of your uh, sort of museum practice seems to mirror the sort of ambition of your film work at this point. Would you say that's true or no? Yeah, I thought this interview about widows. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> um, well, I'm curious about you no, as, no, as, yeah, as a storyteller no, It's good, it's good, it's good. I was, I was like, oh, God, you threw me. Um, and I don't want to bore anyone, so, um, uh, yeah, I, listen, you know, you're I, like just, it's not separate. I, I just want people to come, again, it's, it's very, it's, it's, I think it's very important for me, for example, this film Widows, that I wanted to make a film about people that the people I make the film about come and see. Yeah. You know, that's what I was interested in doing, basically. So, again, you know, um, I, that's, that, that's what I want, was doing in that. As far as this thing in Tate Modern, for example, the school children, I'm photographing um, all, uh, every school in London uh, uh, with seven-year-olds. And for me, that was very important in the way of what London is going to look like, what what London is now, and what it will look like in in, in the future. And I, you know, as a child, I was very fortunate that you know we were bused to, to take modern, we take, take Britain rather. We 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 were bused to sort of the the, the old Vic. We were bused to sorry the Globe. We were bused to these places, and now that doesn't happen anymore. And I just want to have an idea of 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 the future and and, and to look at that. I think people when they see these photographs are going to be pretty. Um, People think they know London, they don't know London. So it's going to be very interesting to visualize what London is actually going to look like rather than what people have a little bit of an idea of, of their part of London, that's all. Right. And it seems, would you say in some way the similar impulse that you want to see people on screen that you see out in the city of Chicago? You want to see people in the museum that are actually the people, the kids living in London? It's going to be alive. If cinema isn't alive and, and, and museums aren't alive, it's, who's it for? I don't know, for yeah. rich people, I suppose. Let's talk about this incredible cast, oh. of starting mm -hmm. with Viola Davis, yeah. um, who just keeps blowing us away, but, and, and somehow hasn't had more roles like this, right? And this is an incredible opportunity for her. Um, uh, but the kinds she should have every few every day. I mean, it's, she's she's astonishing in this film. Can you talk talk a little bit about how do you direct someone like Viola Davis? Is it all there? Are you just um, is it conversations that happen before you get to set? What happens once you're there? I think it's a little rehearsal. It's a little rehearsal. Um, it's conversation, but the rehearsal is the main thing. I think the re rehearsal is very 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 important. You sit down at the table with the script with the actors. And have a discussion and 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 rehearse. There's not too much. I don't like. I like rehearsals where we think about when we talk about the characters and we think what what can we do, what can we change, how we can how can we improve it. A little bit of rehearsal, but I don't like to do too you no know, actual acting rehearsal so much because I don't want the plane to flip and leave the the flipping tarmac. You know what I mean? And, and, oh, flipping and here it, is, it goes. Here it is. And we don't when we get back on the camera, it's not there. So when you have actors that good. It's like holding them back and having the conversation 
And, and when you're on set, that's when you can actually maybe intervene. Because what my job as a director is, is trying to make the actor become a sphere. Meaning that whatever they, to get to a situation, whatever they do is correct. But however they, it, you know, whatever they do is correct. And my job is to try and help them to get to that point and get out of the bloody way. That's it, and say action. And when you're at the point of casting, uh, is, uh, do, you, do you spend a lot of time in the theater? Because obviously Brian Tyree Henry, um, Daniel Kaluuya, yeah. Kaluuya um, Cynthia Erivo, they're all tremendous in this film, and they're all actors that have broken out on stage and mm -hmm. have, have that training. Is it, is it you find it more natural to work with actors without that background? No, I, I find it anyone. I mean, if they're good enough. I mean, I don't care where they come from, in theater or, or, or whatever. But, I mean, you know, again, it's, it's, how I approach this situation is like, for example, with Daniel Kalu, I saw Daniel in a play at the, uh, at the where was it? It was, at, uh, it was called Sucker Punch. And I think, was it, was it, is it where is that? Was that the old Vic? Anyone know that was a, I think it's, it's old Vic, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he played a boxer. And this is, this, and I, I thought he's amazing. Uh, and uh, this is in 2011, that was a long, long time ago, but I thought he was amazing. He did this monologue, uh, skipping, this, this fast skipping, this monologue, which was like three minutes, which is actually incredible. He got his body in this amazing condition, it's rid ridiculous. I thought, okay, I'll put him down. And then I offered him the, I, I offered him the part, and this is just before Get Out came out. So when, when Get Out actually came out, I was just so happy for him, and it was just incredible. And the Cynthia Reed, though, I was told, it was my casting director, Francine Mays, that said, this is this woman who, who's um, uh, doing this thing called Color Purple. You've got to see her. I saw her, and that was it. Elizabeth Becky, I hadn't actually seen her in a, in a play before at all, um, but she apparently was in this um, uh, 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 play called The Maze by Jean Genet, which who I love, and with Elizabeth O'Pair and Kate Blanchett, and apparently she was amazing in that. So she came into an audition. I, oh, wow, and she was fantastic. And Michelle said no, and then I convinced her to say yes, and she did. And, and I'm right, I, I saw a quote where blah, she, said, blah, blah, blah. She, she said no, partly because she didn't like, want to play this kind of uh, sort of weaker woman, or victimized woman who sort of swears by unconditional love. She didn't understand unconditional love or something like that. No, she right. didn't, she didn't. And I, th I think, you know, again, I just met her, and, and you, know, I, in, in, you know, in between that, I auditioned over 100 women. Um, you know, so I had to come back to her after a while because I couldn't find that person. And, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke to her and she said, yes, thank goodness. How did you do that, though? What's, what, what turned it? Well, I think just she trusted me, <laughs> you, know, uh, you, know, you know, and I think that was a thing. I think also, should we just get on? And, but during that time, she found out that this person, I think she was avoiding, she was avoiding playing her mother. You know, there was a real journey. I mean, all, all the women on this picture had a journey in a way, uh, you know, to sort of, uh, f you know, confront certain things, you know, in a way. It's very odd, very interesting. It's very, it's been extraordinary, in fact, uh, the, the, the amount of dialogue is, which has come out of that, yeah. I want to ask you about a few uh, particular moments in the film. Yeah. Uh, I want to start, first of all, the choice, you know, you've done tremendous things with long takes and fast films, and this one, there's this gorgeous shot, the outside of a car, that comes as something of a surprise, and we sit with that shot for a while, and we hear, um, Colin Farrell saying horrible things inside the car, including, have you ever slept with a black guy? Um, as we watch the African-American driver sitting in the front seat, we can just barely barely see him in the, the, behind the glare of the glass. Can you talk a little bit about the intention behind that scene and the way he leaves and says, oh, thanks, John, at the end of that scene? Well, there's five different narratives going on in that, in, in that, in that scene. There's the sort of leaving the, uh, you know, the sort of um, uh, empty lot, the sort of, sort of disheveled, African American, predominantly populated area, uh, and moving, seeing the sort of slow but sure gentrification into the sort of more sort of affluent white neighborhood. At the same time, you have a situation where the, the you know, we understand this this politician Jack Mullingham that doesn't give a damn about the people he just spoke about. Um, that uh, he has a friction with his father. You know, I'm my mother's son. Uh, who's pushing him to be a politician who he doesn't really want to be. Um, and then you understand that this, this, this woman, uh, um, Siobhan, who doesn't say anything in the whole movie, is very vocal behind the scenes. She's the one saying, get your act together, kid. If you want to be mayor, you know, put yourself together. You know, she's being very you know, direct. At the same time, yes, you have this, 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 this driver, this, this, this African-American guy who's driving them and who's hearing all this. But, you know... Who's going to pay him more than Jack Mulligan? 
you know, he knows his job. I know drivers like that. I've been in the back of cars with drivers like that. You told, you told me even worse stories. They're invisible and, and they're necessary. Get me to A to B and that's it. And, you know, and they get it paid. Where are they going to go? No one's going to pay them more than that. And that's it. That's, that's, how, you know, that's, that's real life. So, you know, in one shot, you get, you know, it's economics as well. It's narrative, like I told you, about layers and layers in order to tell you several things in one shot. And it's pulling you, isn't it? It's, actual, actually, it's actually moving the narrative along. And that's what I want to do. It's the economics of a situation. And also, it's about being a British filmmaker who, 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 tries to, who knows how to stretch a pound. That's what it is, really. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you about this. One little, we hear the voiceover in a radio story. It's an interview with a former Black Panther who served time in prison, and he says, uh, the experience changes you to be in a situation where nothing you do makes any difference. Mm -hmm. um, why'd you pick that particular sample? Well, I think, I think this is this Jamal, and Jamal is an interesting character in, this, in, 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 our, in our movie. It's Jatem, excuse me, apologize. Jatem, love, yeah? uh, I love that, love. Uh, because he's a gentleman, he's a man who grew, who's grown up with violence. He's grown up from, with violence from a very early age, and he's, he's become a soldier, um, and he acts on it. You know? And what happens with people like that uh, is eventually they get numb. But you know, while they're killing, at a certain point, they get bored. They get bored of killing. And once they get bored of killing, but they still have to kill, they get perverse with it. Hence what, ha what has happened with the, with the two rappers, hence what's happened with the, the gentleman in, in, in the wheelchair. You get perverse. And then you get to a point where you get so numb, you don't even participate in it. You watch the television. That's what's happening, not just here in the United States, in Chicago, for, for example, other places in America, but in London with, 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 with knife crime. And I think within that narrative, so he's not just a nutcase, uh, he's not just a psychopath, uh, Jatem, but he's, con he's been conditioned in, his, in, in, in an environment where that is his circumstances. And um, he's trying to, in some ways, again, he's within that boredom, within that sort of perversion, he's curious about other things. You know, he's listening to these tapes, for example, and that is one particular one, the Black Panther, and, and then others are sort of, you know, Spanish tapes and, 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 and books, and, you know, he's, he's reading, he's tr you know, trying to sort of, sort of find some other link to something. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what I wanted to do as far as your, your, your term is concerned. He's a guy, he's, he's try, he's, he's, somehow he has to, f how can I say, you know, there's, something, there's obviously something more than what, than what he's been given, and he's curious about the, the broader, wider world. And in that last murder where he just sits down, he, he watches, doesn't... He watches television, yeah. And uh, what's, what's going through his head in that one? He wants to watch the football game, yeah. Um, you once said uh, that you think of art as something like poetry and film is, is more of a novel. Or do you find yourself embracing narrative? Do you, do you can, do you, are you a writer who's going to continue doing all kinds of, of writing? Or do you, are you leaning one way or the other these days? No, actually, what I, what I said, was, said was film. And it, it was about making art with a camera and making narrative feature films with the, with the, with the, with the camera. And it was about the, the, the yarn, um, film being the novel. And um, um, you know, art being more like poetry, condensed, uh, abstract, uh, uh, condensed, um, and that was it. Saying the same thing but saying it differently. That, that, that's what it was about. And the same, they're using the pen for you know to do the, the same things, but doing it in different forms, similar to the camera. And it, it has the process of this film changed your way you, you see your filmmaking process at all? Oh. Does it change the way that the? the yes. I mean, obviously, you've made such you know four very different films at this point, yes. and are, are we to expect the next four to be just as different as the last one? Well, I don't know if this is different to Twelve Years a Slave in a way, because again, it was interesting talking to someone the other day, and it was the person was talking to me about migration. I thought, oh yeah, that absolutely. It's, it's, you know, you talk, talk about Twelve Years a Slave then, and 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 widows now. You know, it's just different time place, time frames, and circumstances. Um, and I think also it's just that I remember someone told me, Steve, oh. I was going somewhere, I said, be careful. I said, absolutely not. And I think that's my thing, not to be careful. Uh, you know, again, I think it's very important not to be careful. I think it's, not, I think it's very important to sort of, uh, um, you know, again, I, 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 
I just want to try things out and mess things up. I try to mess things up with making a film about Bobby Sands, making a film about sex addicts, making a film about slavery, but it doesn't seem to work. It's a fucking boomerang. So I've got to try and throw it hard and, you know, see if I can mess it up. Well, folks, that's unfortunately all the time we have tonight, um, but really want to thank you. Thank you very thank much. You thank coming. you for coming. Thank you. Thank you all. For